Remember the cartoon, The Jetsons, who lived in a world where we'd all have robots cleaning our homes? Well, we're not quite there yet, but robots already do vacuum our floors, assemble our cars, and even fill prescriptions at a new local hospital. Where is all this headed? And how can you tell if your job might get automated out of existence? Angela Schillig is a professor of robotics and the head of the University of Toronto's Dynamic Systems Lab, and she joins us now for some help on that. Nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. Okay, what kind of robots do you build at Dynamic Systems Lab? Yeah, so we work at the Dynamic Systems Lab mostly with flying robots. So these are small flying robots that could be used for commercial applications. But our main work is not on building them, but to actually write the algorithms that automate their behavior and allow them to achieve tasks on their own. Flying robots, did you say? Yes. Why do they fly? So there are several applications you, you can already see today, but um, more to come in the future, where these flying vehicles can give us a perspective that we wouldn't have otherwise. So the, very often right now, they are used to take pictures or videos from the air. That can be done for journalism, but uh, much more important are applications such as precision agriculture, where, where, we, where farmers can observe their fields and see if there are areas where they have to apply more pesticides or where there is a um, the cr crops are not growing as intended. Okay, so the robots that you're involved with, are they taking the place of humans in those tasks? I really view it as an extension of what we as humans are capable of doing. So right now, for example, if they provide us an aerial view, that's an aerial view that we couldn't get otherwise. Very often that's in between what satellites can provide us. And even helicopters, which is very expensive to operate, cannot be launched at that price and speed um, to an individual farmer, for example. So I really do believe that those um, flying robots provide capabilities that we don't have otherwise. For example, they can pr bring medical supplies to um, disaster areas and um, do monitoring tasks in dangerous um, industrial environments. Sure. Now, I would call them flying robots, but you surely don't call them that in the business. What do you call them? Yeah, so the name is something that has changed over the years. Um, these, days, these days, we call them quadrocopters. If we talk exactly about the robots we work with, they have four propellers, um, not like a one big rotor like a helicopter. Um, but the name drone is becoming more and, pop more and more popular also for these commercial applications. I see. Just take us back into history a little bit. At what point did robots start to uh, take over the jobs that people were doing up until then? Yeah, so there the, you have to talk about robots or machines. Where's the difference? Right. So for me, a, important difference is if something moves, like mobile robots, that's clearly different to a, a machine that is stationary. But like in the early 19th century, there was a big industrial re revolution triggered by the steam engine, and that replaced many jobs in manufacturing at that point already. So the printing press wouldn't be, uh, the printing press doesn't move, so that's not on the list. But your flying robots, they would be on the list. Right, so where to draw the line between yeah. a machine that automates a task and a robot, what you call a robot, it's not necessarily clearly defined. But if something starts moving in, in our world, that's clearly something that we call a robot. Verstehe. You're from Germany, we should just say, <laughs> yes, right? Yes, exactly. And, and you've been yeah. in Canada for how long? For now, three years. Three years. Yeah. Your English is excellent. Ausgezeichnet, as they say. <laughs> Tell me this, how well can we predict which jobs are most likely to be automated out of existence and have robots take over doing them? Yeah, so there are definitely tasks that are very difficult for robots to do, and we as researchers work on them, but um, it may not be as clear for the general public. For example, it's very difficult for a robot to understand its environment. So, we can equip it with cameras, but then to interpret the camera pictures and, for example, understand this is a class and that's how I grasp it. Mm -hmm. So understanding the environment from pictures is still something that we cannot do extremely well. The other thing is grasping, for example. We have a very good knowledge as humans 
um, about an object and how to grasp it safely and um, reliably. Mm -hmm. And that's something difficult for a robot. Moreover, a lot of the tasks that require creativity, like not new till how should I say, new skill generation, mm -hmm. um, that's something that's hard for a robot. Right now, for us, robots do the exact task that we program them to do. Angela, there were a couple of researchers at the University of Oxford mm. who put together a bit of a list yeah. on who was more or less likely to lose their job. And I want to share this list with you now and see what you think. Telephone salesperson, 99% mm. likely to have their job automated out of existence. A waiter or waitress, 94%. However, a bartender, 77%. A farm worker, 87%. But the farmer, just 5%. A security guard, 84%. But a photographer, just 3%. Any surprises for you on that list? I think no surprises from, for me. Um, I, just to explain a few of them, for example, telephone salesperson, that's not something that is automated by robotics, but there are, I think, various trends coming together. One is that everything moves towards online, and that on online you have artificial intelligence algorithms that can um, you know, compute based on your profile what kind of information you are interested in and what products you want to buy. So it's just also moving from phone to internet and to artificial intelligence. And then I think something that is a bit obvious in these numbers is ultimately the human has the responsibility. So there's no robot that runs the full farm, like making high level decisions on which crops to plant, um, how to plan, how to inter interpret like unknown situations. That's still something that, that the human needs to do. Mm -hmm. But the repetitive task of, let's say, going through the crops and doing some kind of m maintenance, that's something that a robot can can do. So we're still not at the point where you trust a robot to take that glass and put it up to your lips and have you ha take a drink of water. But we're already seeing some jobs that are being replaced on a massive scale. Bank machines, for example, right? Bank machines have overwhelmingly replaced uh, yeah. many of the tasks that tellers used to do. Can you tell what will be sort of the next big thing to replace what so many people now do? Right, so let me focus again on robotics mm -hmm. and not so much on right, computation and artificial yes. intelligence. So for robotics, still robots operate best if the environment is predictable and known. And so there are many more tasks in manufacturing that robots still can take over. Um, where currently humans are required because it's difficult tasks and require our kind of grasping and um, manual skills. Um, then another one that I would like to personally see is autonomous driving. Uh, there's a huge push right now. It's, it's a very recent trend. All the main um, car manufacturers are working mm -hmm. towards that goal. And I do think that it can provide us with ultimately safer roads. Do you have any nervousness at all about being in a car that is driven by a machine? Um, ex that <laughs> I think no. No, I, I, I do think these machines have to um, have the capability to understand when they don't, cannot handle the situation mm -hmm. and then tell the driver. But ultimately, this, uh, the machine can see better. We can put much more sensors around the car that are enables and situational awareness that's much better than what a human can have. It has a faster reaction time. It doesn't get tired. Um, so it, I it do think- It doesn't yell at the children in the back seat. It doesn't have its <laughs> eyes on the radio changing the station. So right. I do think that um, you know, it would save us a lot of time if that would be automated. Now, as I look around this studio, there are pictures and paintings mm -hmm. on the walls. Yeah. We're not at the point yet where anybody is going to buy a painting made by a robot, right? So mm -hmm. the arts are sort of safe for now? Again, I, I feel the arts are a perfect example of how I um, see the role of technology. Artists are very open to new technology and use new technology, but they use it to enable them to create, um, you know, 
pieces that they wouldn't be able to create otherwise. So I do think that you know, technology in the broadest sense provides us additional capabilities that we wouldn't have otherwise. But it will not replace the inspiration that makes one want to create art. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Understood. OK, a lot of young people watch this program, people who are in university or community colleges, and they're thinking about what careers they want to go into. If you were going to offer them some advice, here's a career mm. that you should go into because you're less likely to be automated out of a job down the road, what would the advice be? Yeah, so I advise to do some, a job that has no routine. <laughs> No routine. So if I look at my professor job, every day is different. And, uh, and we keep embracing technology and using it in new ways. And I, I do think that um, if a job has routines or it's a fixed set of tasks, that um, that is something that could be automated. Hmm. Do you have a list of what you think some of the best jobs would be insofar as you think they'll be around for the long haul? Um, not a list per se, but um, I think any job where you are aware of your responsibilities and you embrace technology to help you to do a better job will ultimately not be replaced because you, you, know, you take ownership of the technology and use it for your purposes to make, make your, t um, you know, your outcomes better. So university professor, yes? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Major League Baseball player, yes? Yeah. <laughs> Even so, there, you know, there, there are um, ideas of robots competing against each other. There's, uh, for example, RoboCop uh, robots that compete in soccer against each other. You are kidding me. It's, it's true. And it has... Who does uh, this? Uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of the leading robotics professors have participated in this challenge. In robo soccer. Yeah. So your robot against my robot, and and you try to score goals. Yeah, and it has definitely helped us to you know um, drive innovation. Uh, is this in a this is not in a big stadium, is it? That people go watch. It's growing and growing, so it it, it is a stadium like really like environment. Yeah. Can you imagine a day where people are going to go buy tickets to sit in a stadium, 40, 50,000 people, to watch robots playing soccer against each other? I think so. I mean, it doesn't replay the human sports, but yeah, I could, I could definitely see that. What's the appeal? There's the equal amount of excitement, I, I think. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, you, you realize that uh, I'm completely skeptical about this now. You can see that. Yeah. I don't, I don't see it. It's the. I mean, to me, the human drama is what makes sports so exciting. Where's the human drama in robots playing soccer against each other? I think what is surprising is that people bond much quicker with robots than you think. <laughs> it's a little bit like they bond with their pets or they talk to their computer. So they also bond with robots uh, more, more than people usually expect. So there are a couple of studies about that. And it's surprising how quickly they kind of bond with the robot. Fascinating. Many of the jobs that are automated are typically filled by low-skilled employees, and I wonder what the future is going to look like for them. Yeah, so I think that there's clearly a shift, and um, it's, it's a re our responsibility as a society to make this shift as smooth as possible from, for those people to find different jobs. But that, that has been you know, achieved in the past several times. I mean, in the past, there were pe a whole warehouse of people doing computations, and they were replaced by the computer, and they found in other jobs. So I do think there is a shift, but these robots need maintenance, um, upgrades that need to be done, and so on, that, that may, may you know, um, help them or be a replacement for current jobs. But those are all high-skilled jobs. I wouldn't say, though, necessarily. No, no because sometimes you can um, attach, like, let's say, a monitor to detect which parts have been failing on the robot. It, it would immediately tell you what, play, uh, what parts to replace, and a person would go in and, you know, replace those, for example. Mm. In the long run, I don't know if this is even possible to know, mm. but in the long run, do you think the new jobs that are created by an increasingly roboticized, automated society will be more than the jobs lost because of automation? 
that has been proven to be the case in the past. So uh, that's the best way to predict the future, I guess. So in the past, that, I mean, there have always been uh, an increased productivity and, and um, societies that embrace technology. The fastest were very usually the ones that grew the fastest. There's two theories on that, though, right? I mean, the fact that it was means that it could be, right. or the fact that it was doesn't mean that it will be. Yes, of course. But I do believe that, that this is not different this time. You yeah. think there will be more jobs in the future? Yeah. We just better have the right skills for those jobs. Exactly. It just means that um, I often compare it with a smartphone. Initially, if people saw a smartphone, they would think, um, you know, this is something I don't need. I don't know what it can do for me. And now it's, it's this empowering device that yeah. enables people to... I don't know, do video calls from anywhere to, to the other side of the world. Yes. And, or, I mean, I like maps because I never get lost anymore. <laughs> so, and I think robots will be these intuitive tools that people can use to um, you know, get things done faster, better, and even extend what they can do right now. Angela, I'm going to read you a quote. This is from Moshe Vardy, a professor at Rice University in Texas, who said... We are approaching the time when machines will be able to outperform humans at almost any task. Society needs to confront this question before it is upon us. If machines are capable of doing almost any work humans can do, what will humans do? That's a great question. How do you answer it? Mm -hmm. I think first we are still far away for machines to do any tasks we can do like being the one who programs those robots. Right now, they are programmed to do a very specific task, right? And at those tasks, they can be better than us. Like a standard robotic arm in an industrial environment operates much more precisely, f much faster than any human could do. Um, and it doesn't need a pension. Yes. <laughs> um, but I feel this just allows us we evolve as, as humans um, to address bigger problems. Right? Um, so if we, like in the past, like thousands of people were doing multiplications and additions every day because there was no computer. And so that would take all their time to do this, what we would now say very trivial tasks. And I think the same will happen in the future that we are free of some of the trivial tasks, which may include driving, but we can use our capa capacity to address bigger problems. Understood. Angela Schirle, thanks so much for visiting us at TVO tonight. Thank you. Dankeschön. Thanks. Wiedersehen. <laughs> Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.